praise God. God is great. God is so great. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory. Divine, I'm salvation, purchased by God, I'm born of His Spirit. And you see, I'm washed, I'm washed in his blood, perfect submission, all is at rest, just I in my I'm happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness. And I'm lost in his love. This is my story. This is, this is my song. Praising my Savior. All the day long. This is, this is my story. This is my song. I'm a praising my Savior. All the day long, this is my story. This is, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Hallelujah. Submission all Just I in my Savior, I'm so happy and I'm blessed. I'm watching and waiting, looking above. I'm born of his good. And I'm washed in his love. For this is my story. This is, this is, this is my soul. I'm praising my Oh, the day long. 
This is my story. This is, this is, this is my soul. I'm a crazy my savior. I'm a praise him all, all the day. Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Everybody is muted. That's great. Sister, thank you very much. You're welcome. God, God bless God. you for that rendition. Praise God. Amen. Well, tonight, are you ready to listen to the word of God? Um, tonight, we're going to look at um, one of the favorite passages of the scriptures. Terry, Sister Terry, are you there with your Bible? With your ancient Bible? Yes. Yeah. Yes. With, your ancient, with your ancient Bible. All right. Terry, <laughs> <laughs> Terry, I want you to read Psalms 23, please. Everybody okay. listen. Yeah. Oh, wow. Psalms 23. Okay. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Father, bless your word and touch your people tonight in the name of Jesus. This is the, best, the most read Psalms in all of Christianity, Psalm 23. We read it at funeral, we read it at celebration. It's the only six verses, but we can stay in this chapter for three months, if we decide to take it verse by verse, phrase by phrase. What I'm gonna to do tonight is to go to, to jump to verse five. I'm gonna leave the, the seasons. Seasons of our lives are divided into, you know, you have the, uh, the, the still waters, the, the green pastures. I'm gonna handle that for another time. But tonight, I wanna to key in on verse five. Verse five, he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's what I want to talk on tonight. May, next week, I'm going to go back and pick another one from this chapter. I do want you to know that we are in challenging times. There are challenge, these are challenging times. A little bug came and all of a sudden the whole world, whether you're, you're a big country, small country, nobody seems to be exempt from the bug. It's killing. Killed thousands of people all over the world. And things are upside down. A lot of people are not sure whether they will go to their job. Some people don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to leave their children at home to go to school? There has been chaos everywhere. Anxiety. People are thinking about their job. Should I go back or should I not go? This is a, these are challenging times. Some people are in financial battle. So many businesses have closed globally. And people are challenged left and right. And so many questions are being asked all over the place. But I do want you to know, when you're a child of God, God protects you. God directs you. God ministers to your necessities. And look at verse 5. He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God, even in this middle of this battle, God is preparing a table before you. Now, how is he doing that? God is preparing a banquet for you. And the Bible says that he prepared a table before me. So God is the, is the host of this banquet. God is the organizer of this banquet. God is setting up the king's table for you. It's a banquet made especially for you. 
because he says he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The, you are the guest of honor. You are the one that God is preparing this banquet for. I do want you to know that this is not God, what God is just doing spontaneously. God didn't just wake up this morning and said, I'm going to prepare. No, that means that God is has given us a well-prepared feast, a banquet planned. And we are going to feast at the king's table. We are the guest of honor. You are the guest of honor. And the king of kings, the I am that I am, is the host, is the one organizing this. This banquet is a public banquet. It's not secret. Because it says the enemy is going to be there watching you. The enemy is not a participant. And God is not ashamed or afraid to organize this banquet for you publicly. It's a public banquet. Everybody knows that God is organizing this banquet. The enemies know that God is organizing this banquet. But you know the, the funny thing about this banquet? This banquet is being organized in the battlefield. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. It means that God is preparing this banquet in the midst of your battle. It could be a sickness battle. It could be a financial battle. It could be a battle with your kids not knowing Christ. It could be a battle in your marriage. It could be a battle in your job. He prepared a table in the presence of that. In the middle of your battle, God is setting up a table and a banquet for you specifically, and it's a public one. You are the one invited, but the enemies are not. Now, what are the enemies? What are the enemies? He says, in the presence of my enemies. What are they? There are three major enemies identified in the scriptures. And these enemies, whatever we go through, these enemies are responsible for the chaos and calamities that we face. Enemy number one is the world. The world. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Tell you, can you read it? 1 John 2, 15. Through 17. 17. Yeah. One and the, John, two verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Okay. Enemy number one is the world. And you know, you've been criticized by people. Some of you have been rejected by family members. Some of you have been called names. Some of you have been derided, degraded on your job. Some people have really tried to plot your job and lied against you. And the world all around you, they are all doing critical things and everything against you. That's one of the enemies. Because the Bible says the world is the enemy of God. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The world is an enemy of God. When we operate according to the dictates of the world, we are not going to reap the financial benefits or the benefits of, of being in a, a battle, in a banquet, in the midst of a battle with God. So we have three enemies, the world. People have said critical things about you to try to bring you down, to try to destroy you, to try to lie against you. They know you are working with God. They want to distract you and all of that. That's an enemy. Enemy number two is Satan. Satan is an enemy. The Bible talks about Satan in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes there to do what? To destroy, to destroy, to kill, to destroy. It's not so much that the devil wants to destroy you or me. It's so much that the devil wants to get to God. He knows that he cannot do anything to God. And he knows that the only way he can reach God or try to get to God is by trying to attack us because he knows that God loves us so much that he wants to do what? To attack us. He wants to derail us so that he can get, just look at it like this. When people want to get at you, it's okay if they, if they get at you, but it's not okay when they start talking about your children or your grandchildren. I mean, 
that's when you really know what, what is in you. Now, my wife used to be okay. I mean, when you talk about her or me, but when you talk about the kids, she, she goes off. You can't talk about her kids. And I know that's the same with most parents here. Or your kids or your grandkids. That's the same thing the enemy is doing. But God is prepared a table, even in the midst of these enemies, even in the middle of these enemies trying to derail us. God has prepared a table in the midst of the battlefield. And then enemy number three is the flesh. The flesh is the biggest enemy. You see, the Bible says, resist the devil and he shall do what? Flee. But how do you resist the flesh? If you read Galatians 5, we, can't read, we don't read it tonight, but you see the Bible says the flesh lost it against the spirit and the spirit lost it against the flesh. The apostle Paul said so many, much, a lot of things about the flesh. He said the good that is in me that I want to do, I end up doing evil. I end up doing evil rather than the good that I really want to do. That's the flesh. The flesh will tell you, oh God, why are you wasting your time going to church? The flesh will tell you it's Sunday morning, just relax. Have a good time. Go on vacation. You haven't taken vacation in three months. Why are you going to go to church? The flesh will tell you even when you want to study the Bible. Why are you trying to study the Bible? Just, just take off one day. Just relax. And, you know, give your body. But I'm not preaching against, um, I mean, vacation and all of that. No. I'm talking about the fleeting pleasures of the flesh trying to derail us from the word of God. And the flesh is the biggest enemy. Why? You go to bed with your flesh, you wake up with your flesh. You wake up with it. Sometimes some of the things we blame the devil for, it's not only the devil, is the flesh. That's why the Apostle Paul says it in uh, Corinthians 9.27, he said, I pummel my body <coughs> and keep it under what? Subjection. That after preaching the gospel, I myself will not be a cast away. The flesh is terrible. The flesh is deadly. If you give the flesh an inch in your life, the flesh will go a hundred miles. So, but interestingly, God is preparing this table in the presence of our enemies. In the presence of the challenges, the battles of life. In the presence of the flesh, the devil, and uh, the world is preparing. Why? It's almighty God. It's almighty. We have the protection we need from him. He provides the security that when you are in the middle of this banquet with him, no enemy will come in and destroy you. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. No enemy will trick you. Because God has prepared a table in the presence of all the enemies and God provides the security and the protection you need while you go through the... I remember when we had a war back home and there was a place called Mami Market. If you're in Nigeria, you know. Mami Market is a market where you have a bunch of women selling cooked food, delicious food. And then in the middle of the battle, the heat of the battle, we will fight all day in the, in the axis where I was, the axis commander. Uh, some of you from Nigeria will know the place called Abagan. I was one of the axis commanders. And it was a, one of the hottest combat zones, one of the hottest fighting area. I was one of the youngest captains in that, in that war. We would fight all day. And then when we come back to Mami Market, we are relaxed. Oh, because we have all kinds of goodies. We come out, the mommy market is not too far away from the front, from the place we are fighting. We just put our weapons. After we are tired, we cast our weapons down with our bodyguards and we just relax and, and we eat. And it seems like we are feasting and just forgetting about the battle for a while. That's exactly what the Lord is doing with us in the midst of our battles. God has set a table, a banqueting table that no one will destroy you, no one. I want you to know this. I want you to know this. 
in the presence of your enemies. God has set up this banquet. Now, why does God do something like that? God is almighty. Doesn't really need you and I. But the Bible says he created you and I for his own pleasure. Why, why do we have a banquet with God? Why is God setting up this banquet? Remember, in your life and my life, when we want to have fellowship with a brother or a sister, we say, let's go out to lunch or a co-worker, right? We go to lunch, we are having fellowship. God desires to have fellowship with us. As big as he is, he wants to know us more as us knowing him more too. It's a symbiotic relationship. Oh God, I want to know you more. As you want to know him more, God begins to know you more. He deposits himself more. It happens in fellowship, in communion. Communion, fellowship. It's where you get to know each other. Even when you look at United Nations or the White House, or when they are making decisions or talking about policies, they have a big table with food and they are talking. That's emblem, symbol of that fellowship. You grab a sister, a brother, I say, let's go out to lunch. Why? Fellowship. Sister Terry, I want you to read the Psalms 5 verse 11. Psalms verse 11. Psalms 5, 5, 11. Okay. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. We'll be joyful. So we are having fellowship. God is defending us during our fellowship. We get acquainted with him. We rejoice. He shows us his love. And we know that God is with us. He says, I, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. How do we know that? We fellowship with him. We fellowship with him because he set a banquet for us with your name on that banquet. You are the guest of honor. He is the host. He is having fellowship with you. And in that fellowship, we rejoice. He's revealing himself to you. And you are going after him. So you will know him more. And God wants to know you more as well. It's a symbiotic relationship. The enemy cannot get it. God will show that he loves you publicly. It's a display of his love. Sister Terry, read Sons, Sons of Solomon 2.4. It's one of my favorite verses. Sons of Solomon 2 verse 4. Verse four, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Amen. So in this banquet, God, there's a banner. There's a banner displayed by God and he says his banner over me is love. This is the love of God. I am having fellowship with my son and my daughter and I want to display my love publicly. You know the song, he brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me, his love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me, his love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me, his love. His banner over me, his love. Sing it if you know it. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me, his love. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me, his love. He brought, he brought me, me to me his me banqueting me table, his banner over me, his love, his banner over me, his love. Somebody his shout love. hallelujah. Oh, amen. He, he brings us to that banqueting table. He displays his love for us publicly. There are people who are afraid of God. They are afraid of God because they don't know him. They think that God is just waiting for you to make a mistake so he can tackle you and beat up on you. That's not the God we serve. I mean, there was a time I preached that kind of gospel. That doesn't mean that God uh, allows or permits uh, foolishness and, and sinful. No, I'm talking about the love in God. I'm talking about re we reverence him, not to run away from him. We reverence him because of his love. He's our father. He's banqueting over us his love. He puts that banquet in Song of Solomon and love over. He brought us to that banqueting table and there is a banner that says 
I love you. You're mine. You're mine. You're mine. You're mine. I love you like the apple of my eyes. That's what God is doing. And then we love him back. As we love him, you know, we, we can't really not draw to God except the spirit draws us. We can start going in mm. the flesh, but the spirit picks up in the spirit. I mean, the spirit picks us up. So know that he loves you. In the, let me tell you this, so that let it get in your spirit. When God wants to bless you, there is nothing anybody can do to stop it. Are you hearing me? When God, God wants to bless you, and God has determined he's going to bless. There's nothing. People can fight you over your job. They can fight you over your life. There's nothing they can do to stop it. Nothing. Man is helpless when God. If you look at Psalm 44, we don't have to read it, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 44, verses 2 and 3, you can read it later. The Israelites said this. Our fathers have told us how much you did, what you did for us. What you did for them, how you brought them out. And they did not come out of that war because they were men of war. No, that wasn't why. He said, you had favor on them, your right hand, because of your right hand, because you favored them. It's not because they were mighty men of war. It's because of your favor. I want to tell you, when God's favor is on you, there's nothing man can do to stop it. Nothing. And I want you to know that God's favor is on every child of God that's walking with him in love. In relationship, in obedience, in submissiveness. Your favor, his favor is on you. There's nothing anybody can do to stop the favor of God. You are the only one who can stop it. By not seeking him, by not by being out of fellowship with him. As long as you're in fellowship with him, he wants to bless you and nothing anybody can do to stop it. Nothing. Nothing. So that's exactly what happens when we get into this fellowship with him. And when we begin to chat with him, and God is blessed. Let me, let me, uh, Sister Terry, read, 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 read Job 36, 16. Job 36, verse 16. Job 36, 16. Even so would he have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness, and that which be set on thy table should be full of fatness. Okay. You see the invitation to come to the table. The invitation to come to the table from God. Even in the book of Job. He wants us inviting you. Calling you to a perpetual banquet. And your whatever your, your anxieties, your worries and all that. You set them aside. Because you're going to the table that God has prepared for you. And where God himself is the host and you are the guest of honor and the enemies are there watching but they are helpless because they keep they can't do anything about it they can't do anything mm -hmm. about it that's an Nigerian song that says when jesus said yes nobody can say no that's a song when jesus says yes to you no one can say no that's why no one can rob you of that blessing except you so perpetual invitation Get your worries and anxieties out of the way. You get stronger by wanting to know him, by wanting to have fellowship with him. God wants to bless you so that the world may see the goodness of God. Sister Terry, read Psalm 31, 19. Psalm 31, 19. Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. You see that? His goodness. He wants to show his goodness to us. <clears throat> to those that trust him, he shows his goodness. Why? So that people would know that this is the God we serve and they want to serve him. He shows his goodness so that people will know. That our God is a good God. And they want to serve the God. They want to serve the God you and I serve. So what do we do? Read the Psalms 35, 27, Sister Terry. Psalms 35, 27. Psalms 35, 
Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which had pleasure in the prosperity of his Amen. servants. Amen. God has pleasure in your prosperity. God has pleasure in your prosperity. Yeah, another translation said, he has pleasure in your success. Yeah, why? When people see that, what are they going to do? Oh, this is a Christian. They want to know your God. That's part of the fellowship. That's part of the expose. That's part of the relationship. God begins to bless it. Bless you, draw you closer to him, and you get to know him. He gets to know you. And as he does that, he takes pleasure in your success. He takes pleasure. In, I had somebody say, all this success, success, Christians talk, talk about. Um, I don't know. I said to the person, okay, do you want failure now? Do you then want us to talk about failure? Is failure better than success? She said, no, no, I don't mean it that way. I said, well, what do you mean? So many Christians are afraid of talking about success. They are afraid of talking about prosperity. They are afraid of talking about the goodness of, why? What is wrong? Are you telling me that God did all these things and said, I'm going to give the good things to the devil and his crowd, and then I'm going to deprive my children of the best things? How can that be? How can that be? God wants to see well, God wants people to see his goodness in our lives. When he sees in his goodness in our lives, people see it, then they want to serve him. They want to serve him. It's a love relationship. And that's why he says he takes the light in the prosperity of his servants. Let me go to the next thing because of time. When you go to a banquet, right, they give you a menu selection. You have a menu selection. There's a place, when we went to Brazil, there's a Brazilian restaurant. I think they have one here in Orlando. I haven't been to the one in Orlando yet. I don't know if I will ever be because that restaurant is unique, okay? When you sit down, guess what? The buffet, you don't go for the buffet. They keep serving your table. I mean, they will bring you pork, chicken, beef, um, fish, everything. They keep bringing it. They keep even gizzard, liver. They keep, you know, when they stop bringing it, you have to put a white flag on your table. You surrender. If you don't surrender, they keep coming to your table. They have one in Orlando. It's called the Texas, the Brazil here. I mean, you have the best meat. You know, Brazil has the best uh, meat. They export uh, beef. I don't eat beef anymore, but those days, yeah, we did. It was organic beef, organic chicken. They, they, will, they kept coming. So I said to Bishop Emmanuel, why are they? They don't they see I haven't finished. This one there, Bishop Emmanuel said, oh, you ought to put a white flag. <laughs> if you don't, they will keep coming. A white flag means I surrender. <laughs> I mean, the main is something. Yes, in Orlando, they have it. They call it Texas de Brazil. So that's the kind of, and then you think about the menu in the banquet that God has prepared for us, for you, with your name on it. What is the menu? How do we find the menu? The menu is wonderful, the word of God. The promises of God, more than 5,000 promises directly to us in the scriptures. You got to keep honoring God with your life through studying the word of God, reading the word of God, meditating the word of God, and doing the word of God. We need to, every day you don't read the word of God, you lose momentum. How can you be in love with somebody and you don't even talk to him daily? Those of you who are in marriage relationships or courting, you know. You know when we are courting, my wife and I used to go, when we go to restaurants, we look around. She said to me, you see those couple, they are new. You see how they are holding and laughing at each other. He said, I want to see them 10 years from now. <laughs> they're going to still be doing the same thing. Then you see the ones who have been in love, been in marriage for 30 years, they look like, they are strangers. <laughs> they are looking at themselves. <laughs> no more cuddling and all that. <laughs> you see the younger ones, they are just cuddling and laughing and touching each other. They haven't gone through things yet, you know. But it's not supposed to be that way. You see? So the word of God is where the menu is. I remember a sister when the pastor, the pastor talked about studying the word of God. <coughs> she went to church 
with her son. So on weekday, the pastor was visiting their home. And when the pastor visited their home, the little boy said, Mama, Mama, I want you to show the pastor. Let me show the pastor the book. And the pastor was so delighted because the pastor knew he, he had been teaching about people studying the word of God and falling in love with God. So the young kid went and brought the book that the mother spent most of her time on. It was Sears, it was Sears catalog. It wasn't the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> the pastor was thinking the young guy was going to bring the Bible. <laughs> the, the woman spent too much time on Sears catalog. <laughs> and not the word of God. <laughs> you know, children are something. <laughs> they can expose us. So the word of God is the bread of life. And we need to, we need to fall in love with the word of God. Because you can have all your fears and anxieties that go down by studying God's word. Sister Terry, read Psalms 119 verse 103. That's where we get our strength in. Psalms 119 verse 103. 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Can you believe that? The word of God, sweeter than honey. Yeah. Oh, we need to fall in love. I keep falling in love with him, falling in love with him over and over again. It keeps getting sweeter as the day go by, right? We need to fall in love Amazing. with him over, over and over again. Why? Studying the word of God. All the promises of God are in him, here yeah, and here. There are so much menu in that word. Every challenge in life, everything, God has your back covered on his word. Spend time in that word. Let that bread of life, the Bible calls it the bread of life. Let it get into your spirit. When it gets into your spirit, things will begin to happen. Your fears will begin to dissipate. And you yeah. are in the spirit of fear. You read, you read the Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear thou not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. The word of God is sweeter than honey. Sister Terry, read the word. Read, read Jeremiah 15, 16. Jeremiah 15, 16. 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. Amen. We are called by his Amen. name. What did Jeremiah do to the word of God? He said he ate the word of God. Ate mm -hmm. He ate it. Can you believe that? He ate God's word. And this was in the Old Testament. Now we have the new and the old. And the Bible says the new is better than the old. We can go to the word of God. Spend time in the old or the new. Especially the new. And eat it. Dedicate. Whatever we are facing, we're going to face. They are all covered in the word of God. He said, I saw your word and I ate it. I ate the word of God. That was how precious the word is. Psalm 119 that we read. 103 says your word is sweeter than honey. You guys know the honey, sometimes the honey is corrupt now. It's, they add so much to the honey to make it even more sweeter. But the Bible says the word of God is sweeter than honey. Fall in love with God over again. Get into this banquet because his banner over you is love. And when God has determined to bless you, there is nothing anybody can do to stop it. Nothing. Favor is not fair, but God is good. You just yes. bask in the presence of God. A lot of us are spending too much time on social media. Too much time on social media. That social media can be disheartening. Too much mm -hmm. news can be disheartening. I'm not saying don't watch news. Look at the headlines. But if you spend more time on the news than you spend in the scriptures, you're going to live a life of anxiety and panic attacks because there's nothing that you're going to get most of the time from the news that is going to be positive that will going to edify you. I'm not saying don't, just be wise. God has given us this banquet. He's given us this menu. And this menu is, is 
unsearchable riches of Christ. Every challenge you have, I have, the answer is in the word of God. If this worked for David in the Old Testament, it's sweeter than honey. And we have the New Testament that the Bible said is better than the old one, better covenant. It's going to be even much more sweeter than honey. Every day that you don't look in the world, you lose ground. And you become rusty. Take time and study the word. And you see the menu that God, he prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemy. He knew the enemy would be there. He's not intimidated by the enemy. He gives you the protection you need while you're feasting in the presence of the enemy. You won't be destroyed. He gives you the dependency, the reliability and the reliance that the word of God gives to us. Terry, finally, read Psalms 34 verse 8. Psalms 34 verse 8. Psalms 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Go on. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is man. How do we taste and see that the Lord is good? We study the word of God. Study the word of God. The good news about this is that there's nothing empty in the word of God. Let me just close mm -hmm. by saying this. You work, a lot of you have jobs. And you've worked for some bosses that have integrity. And some of those bosses, they give you the promises and you take it to the bank. They will do it. There are some that you can't take their word seriously because they don't perform. But there are a majority mm -hmm. of the bosses have integrity. And you work for organizations that pay you monthly or every two weeks. And if you do, most of them do direct deposit. And... You go there, your check is there. They make sure because of the integrity of the company. Some companies, if they don't have it, they borrow money and make sure they pay their employees. And we depend on what they come, we plan against that money. We are never thinking that they will not, we will not get paid. Every once in a while, you work for a company that is not solvent. But the majority of the time, the companies are solvent. But now the word of God is telling us, oh, test and see that the Lord is good. God is more reliable than your company. It's more reliable than your organization. And yet your organization has been faithfully paying you every day, every week or every month. God does better than all of them. Oh, test and see that the Lord. How do we test and see? The word of God. The word your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, Father, we thank you for you have prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And we will come out of that banquet on top because your banner over us is love. We give you the glory tonight for your people. We magnify you for ministering to our necessities. Thank you for the revelation. Oh, God. Is there anyone that's going through challenges of life? The banner of love over them right now because you do have the light in their prosperity. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.